Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's live force uh, session. All right. Uh, today, we are going to talk about how to use reference. We're going to go a little deeper than that, to tell you the truth. Um, we're not only going to talk about how to use reference, um, but we're going to dig uh, a step further. It's what you know, how to best use the reference that you have and what those different uses are. Right. So it's really important to get a sense of um, of what its, its purpose is in the first place. What is the job? So each one of our instructors is going to share with you a different, um, a different use. Uh, and then within that different use, we're gonna talk about how do you best use it, okay? So uh, welcome guys. Hey, Mutunjay, how you doing? Yeah, I'm doing good. How are you? All right, good. Sorry about the late time. Over in India, Mutunjay's partying at 2, uh, 2 a.m. here with us. So thank you for your, uh, your commitment. <laughs> I'm drunk a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, Diego, how are you? Hey, how are you, Mike? How are you guys? Doing good. good. Diego, again, you're going into uh, your summer holiday. <laughs> yes, exactly. We're getting into Christmas and New Year's and all that. Exactly. What During year was months. this year? 2020? What happened with 2020? 20. I know. God. <laughs> 2020. 2020 is come and gone so quickly. How are you doing, Swenley? Yeah, great. Excited for today's subject, as always. So yeah. It's going to be good. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Me too. I think it's, there's a lot of fun stuff that we're going to share with you guys today. It's going to be interesting to look at all the different uses. And I'm sure there's more uses than what we're going to show you, but we picked what we consider our tops and, again, how to best use them. Um, so to start this off, um, I want to begin with the comment below which is in order to use it well, we need to know what it will be used for, right? This sounds like it'd be really obvious, uh, but you know, again, I'm mentoring all week long and I run into this dilemma with students all the time. They might be learning a certain topic in you know, the forest drawing process and they pick um, the incorrect reference based on what they're actually trying to learn at that time. It's kind of what started driving this conversation in the first place is you guys knowing how to pick great reference, right? And we want to try to help you today in being able to do that. Okay, so to start this conversation off, if for instance here, I wanted to drive this nail <laughs> into this piece of wood, I would not use a screwdriver. I could use a screwdriver, right? I could try to hammer that nail in with the back end of the screwdriver and uh, Embarrassingly, I have to say I have done that before myself, <laughs> but that's not the best tool to do that with, right? And this is the kind of situation that we come into, right? It's like, I'm trying to accomplish X. In this case, I'm trying to get this nail into the piece of wood, but I don't pick the right reference to do the particular job, right? And that's what we wanna to try to help you guys with today, all right? So we know what would be best to drive that nail into the piece of wood, that would be a hammer, right? But I would not use a hammer to eat a bowl of soup. <laughs> Again, just trying to make a point. It may be funny here, but the truth of the matter is this is the kind of thing that actually happens week in and week out in us teaching. And I'm sure it happens to you guys you know, as well at home. So I'm gonna show you some examples of figure work where this occurs, okay? So I might have a student that is learning how to draw form, okay? Um, or maybe they're trying to learn how to draw, uh, I don't know, the muscles of the abdomen right? This would not be a good photograph for that. What is this image good for? We can talk about rhythm in this image. This image has torso rotation. So if I were to say to someone, look, I think you need to learn CS torsos or certain type of torsos. I want you to understand rotation. This would be a good reference image, right? We can see <clears throat> that the model is pulling from the screen right pelvis up to the screen left shoulder, right? Uh, this this image has good facial expression, right? If we were talking about faces, I'd say this is actually a great reference, right? Uh, it's got good forearm anatomy, right? You could see uh, the musculature uh, in the model's forearm, right? If I wanted to talk about tattoos and use tattoos to help develop wrapping around anatomy, I can use that for this. If I wanna learn about drawing mustaches and beards, right? We've got this, we've got Diego, right? <laughs> All right, so we can do that. What is this not good for? This is not a great painting reference. And this is a really important thing I, I, I wanna bring up. 
sometimes what comes in is you guys grab photographs from other sites, which is fine. Like, you know, it's all open game. I think you should grab reference from wherever you can. Um, but you don't want to grab photography reference for painting. How do you know it's for painting? Well, what's good for painting is to have stronger lighting, right? You want light to show off volume. Um, the model here is relatively evenly lit. He's not, you know, the, the point of light reference in here is not super strong from one specific location. It's not driven to have like reflected light or edge light or rim light, whatever you want to call it. So it's not great for painting. His face looks like really dark, probably because he's more tanned and his skin is light. So it starts fooling my brain and to think what it light and shadow is, right? So not too great for painting. Not great for foreshortening. Why? Well, because he's standing straight up and down. He's in front of me. The perspective plane is kind of stomach or a little higher, um, but I'm not getting a lot of foreshortening. There's not a lot going on in this figure that's coming towards me or going away from me. So last but not least, it's also not that extreme. If I say to you, hey, you know, you should go out and get really extreme force poses with the model's feet planted on the ground because we want to talk about balance. This one's not that extreme. It's got some rotation in the torso. It's got a little thing going on in the feet, but it's not super exaggerated. There's not a lot of left to right action to help you develop um, rhythm, right? Rhythm in this pose, okay? So, um, so that's one, right? Here's the second one. So the flip side of it is this one. This one has some good rhythm in it, uh, good form, right? This has a lot of depth, a lot of space in it. And I can see that really clearly that the shoulder is really close to me, right? It's like right in my face, right? Or in your face, right? His shoulder's here. And then we go back, you know, smaller and smaller and smaller, you know, down towards his pelvis and down towards his feet. Uh, I want to, I can work on force here. I could talk about the bridge torso, right? Cause he's supporting himself with his arm all the way down to his legs. We could talk about the trapezius, right? I could see the top edge of the trapezius and its function. It's not good for a balanced standing pose cause that's not what he's doing. It's not good for facial expression. I can't see his face. It's not good for the rest of the muscles of his back cause we can't see his back, right? And it's not good as a standing pose. So as obvious as this may seem, this is what I see happen in the mentorship, right? So be aware of what your task is. What are you using the reference for and find the right reference? Not all references alike, right? Is there anything you guys wanna to add to this before we start jumping over to Diego? I think it sounds uh, pretty obvious, like when you hear it, but then uh, we find out uh, pretty commonly that People don't get it. It's like it, it sounds. I, I I bet all of you uh, think about yeah yeah that that's silly what you're saying, Mike. It's obvious you're not going to use that reference uh, for the back muscles, and that is pretty easy to 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 guess, right? If you don't see the the, the back, you won't use that for uh, back muscles. But for example, if you want to get uh, to foreshortening or perspective or whatever, every pose got a little bit of perspective and foreshortening because unless you're just a piece of wood, right? A two by four standing up, then you will have a little bit of perspective, but uh, there are some better than others, right? And one thing we were talking uh, before that people, when they start drawing, they try to get the more difficult pose ever, like old gymnastic that turns like this and got a shoulder coming up from here. And you say, don't pick that because that's really hard and no, all humans can do that. So you better start with, with easy things and, and, and then go increasing the difficulty. Uh, that it's... Yeah, what, what Diego's talking about is prior to starting the meeting today, um, I had a mentorship session with someone earlier this week that's pretty new. Uh, and a couple of weeks ago, they came in with models that were in, you know, like yoga positions and pretzels. And I'm like, whoa, like that's way too complicated. Don't start there, right? So they, so they were here and I was like, don't go there. That's too far this way. I said, just get to models that are standing on their feet, right? And standing and try to get some, you know, get drama. So then they came in the following week, which was this past week, all the way over here. All of a sudden they had models that were standing, but they were almost like catalog pictures. They were not catalog pictures, but they were almost like catalog pictures where the models just kind of standing there doing nothing, right? I mean, it uninspires me. It doesn't inspire me at all. You know, and I'm like, look, now you went all the way from one extreme with, you know, with pretzels over here. And then you went all the way over here with, to, you know, uh, Diego's point, almost like a two by four stick that's standing there. 
does, does it mean there's no force there? No, there's, there's force there no matter what, because there's gravity and human anatomy is built around that. So there's always going to be force, but it's not that dramatic, right? And if you're at the beginning of your force journey, if you're on the website or not, my suggestion is find poses of models that are standing on their two feet that are doing dramatic things with their legs and their upper body where you can see how they're fighting balance. And you're basically looking for poses that look like this, right? You want diagonals. You want to see like, hey, the torso is going this way and the back's going like this and the pelvis is over here. And as you get these angles going like this, you're going to end up getting rhythm uh, in the figure, right? You don't want this and you don't want this, <laughs> right? Like this does not work at the beginning. It's really, really difficult, right? So you're looking for this right? That's what you want to try to find at the very start and try to get them with their feet for the most part planted on the ground so you can better understand how things are working. So again, what we're trying to find is reference that is best for that particular use. The use here is, hey, I'm a beginner. I'm trying to learn how to draw with force. I want poses of models with their feet on the ground so I can understand balance, but I want to see the drama. It should be clear enough for me as a beginner to try to get a sense of how things are moving around. See. So the reference has to be best based on what the purpose is, okay? All right, um, Diego, I'm gonna hand it off to you so you can do your, your slides. You ready? Okay. So, Hold on a second. here we go. There you go, there you go, yeah. All right, so uh, as you may know, we have a limited time, so I'm gonna try to fit everything I have to show you in small amount of time. Uh, I love this subject and it's one of my favorite uh, copy and study. And as you can say here, say what, why, and how. So uh, first I, I use and instead of verses because I feel like there's something you can do with copy, but I, I will uh, expand that later. So here we are, copy and study. Let's start with this theory. That is the TPT the parrot theory. What is the parrot theory? Well, I, I talk about this in the previous session, but, uh, but I go over a little bit uh, deeper now. And you can teach a parrot to sing happy birthday, right? We all see parrots saying hello or happy birthday uh, singing that song. I won't sing anymore, I promise. Uh, so the thing is that the parrot won't know when it's your birthday. birthday right? He, he won't start singing to you the day of your birthday because he doesn't mean it, right? He doesn't understand what he's saying or what he's singing. So the parrot is just copying what somebody else said or song, a sing, right? Like, like the, the happy birthday song, they just sing that but doesn't understand a thing. So what's the problem with that? Sorry, that's not the key. Uh, the problem that is the meaning, it has no meaning. So you have no idea what you're talking about, right? So you're, you're talking nonsense. Let, let's put this in drawing. If you're just copying what other people are drawing, you're talking nonsense. You're drawing nonsense. You, you don't have no idea what you're talking about. So what, what that means that you're lying. So you have no idea what you're talking about. You're lying and you're lying with the style because you're, if you're copying somebody else's drawing or somebody else's painting, you're copying kind of the style, but having no idea what you're talking about. So you're basically lying. So when I see a drawing, and this is uh, a, a cool thing to know when you're presenting portfolios, uh, I know that you're lying because I know that you have no idea what you're talking about. Imagine somebody else is coming to you and start talking things that you realize that he doesn't know a thing about what he's talking about. So that is a copy of a drawing or a copy of a painting, right? We're still talking about copying, right? And the problem is that your focus here when you're copying is really, really small. Right, you you know you what you're not watching the whole thing. You're just watching little things like oh look, look that tattoo, or look that line that goes this way, and you're not thinking about what you're drawing. Maybe you're drawing like uh, a figure, and you're thinking about that silhouette or uh, the the little bump 
here's in the shoulder or something like that. Your, fo your focus is really small. So you're lying, you have no meaning about what you're saying uh, and your focus is too small, right? So that's the problem with the power of theory. But be happy because I have the antidote. And the antidote is really, really simple. First, focus big. Think beep, big. Because if you're thinking big, you will start to understand the whole thing. For example, if you're drawing a tree, you think about that tree. So you know, I'm drawing a tree. How the tree is working is leaning to one side, it's leaning to the other, there's wind, or there's no wind, or it has branches, or it has leaves in the end of the branches, and you're thinking about everything. Then you go focusing on small things later. But first, think big. Then, if you think big, we already know it's a tree. We're trying to draw a tree that somebody else drew before or paint before. So I'm talking about uh, copying drawings or study drawings, right? Or paintings. Uh, so truth, speak up and explain what you see, right? When you see the tree, I want you to explain me in the paper what you're seeing. Explain to me. There's no way you can explain something if you don't understand what you're trying to say, right? That's a great way to learn. Try to explain somebody whatever you just learned Try to explain it to somebody and you'll see how much you know about it. So when you're drawing, you're explaining. So if you're explaining the truth or at least the truth you think you know, that drawing is going to be better than lying with style. So that's the second part of the antidote. And the third part of the antidote is the meaning. Mean what you're saying. And that's where lying comes in right if you are confident about your line because you know that what you're saying is truth because you know what you're talking about because you're focusing big then the drawing it change all the way it's totally di different a lie imagine whatever you're talking about anything right you're talking about whatever you want but you know about the subject so you whatever you said it feels strong it's, it feels real so i trust what you say well, I trust your drawing. When I see a drawing that is, has big focus, is talking about truth, and you mean what you say, that drawing looks completely different. So that's the parrot theory. And let's go to see some examples of what you can do with this once you fix all this parrot problem. So Diego, before you start showing yeah. the photos, um... We had one or two people I wanted to clarify that are like, I'm not really sure if I understand. So okay. like till Dan Daniel, for instance, what Diego's getting at is the parrot theory is a parrot learns how to mimic what it's taught, right? Like I teach the parrot to sing happy birthday as you guys were sort of joking around in the, in the chat on, right? But the parrot doesn't know that it's singing happy birthday, right? It might sing happy birthday. It doesn't know what a birthday means. It doesn't know what happy means. There's no meaning behind what it does. So it's it's literally mimicking or copying what its owner is telling it to do because it can recognize the sounds and therefore remakes the sounds, right? So when you're doing that in the world of art, you might remake a line or a brush stroke, but the artist who created it is doing those things for some purpose, some meaning. They understand that they're using a line to create form, as an example. So when you mimic that or try and copy it as a beginner learning how to draw, if you just copy the line without understanding that line is being used for form, you're just copying a line. It doesn't mean anything. And I, I would add one big note to all the stuff Diego's talking about here as he shows us these examples. Um, can you stop sharing for a second, Diego, just so we can yeah, sure. do more face to face for a moment? So, you know, the big difference here is just um, the other big deal here is it's not only in drawing what Diego's talking about. This is from reference as well, right? So we were talking about the reference Diego is describing today is art reference, right? He's going to show you examples in a moment, but this can also be reference from a model, right? And that's where a lot of students start drawing, right? It might be um, a real figure or a photograph of a figure. There seems like there's this small um, separation between copying and studying. 
but yet it's might as well be the Grand Canyon, right? Because on one end, you're purely just drawing what you see. Um, and to be clear, it's kind of thoughtless, all right? To be blunt, it's kind of thoughtless. If you're thinking anything, you might just purely be thinking about the measuring of things. You wanna get that angle right, it's this long, it's this short, right? That's, that's about the extent of the thinking. And what Diego's trying to present and what we believe on drawingforce.com is, you know, when you look at reference, it's how much do you have to say behind that? So the stretching of this, the twisting of that, and it's, it can go all the way down to like the stretching of the rib cage and the hardness of the bone pushing out against the skin, right? You can get texture in there. You can get um, the depth of force, the depth of anatomy, all of that gets in there. That's very different than just copying a drawing or copying the reference. So uh, Diego, take it back over. Uh, you have some awesome references that he's going to show us um, drawings of, and you'll see what we're talking about. Okay, here, for example, we have uh, that. Sorry, uh, that, that was great, Mike. Uh, great, great clarification. Uh, yeah, so uh, here we have a drawing of Jason Kim. This is uh, uh, a drawing of Hulk from Disney Infinity that never got out in the open, but it, it is great and I, I love it. So imagine you see this on Instagram or on Pinterest or whatever and say, oh, that's cool. I want to I want to draw that. I want to copy it. And now here's the, 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 the power of theory. If you just copy, you will learn anything. You just kind of copying. The good thing here is what, what can you can you use this to learn? What, what can you learn from this? And you can learn a style because Disney Infinity has a great style to its figures. Right, so you can learn style, you can learn anatomy because it's really well simplified, but it's really well created the anatomy, right? Uh, so you can learn perspective. Again, what we talked before, look at look at the fist or, or, or even the fingers. We have the fingers here uh, on the front. Look, they, they have a lot of volume, a lot of structure in there. Uh, so you can learn all that. Here, look at the leg, uh, okay? So, but look what I'm saying, it's, it's like I'm investigating that here it changed and it's another plane here. So I'm thinking about uh, deeper than just copying. Oh, this there's a line. There's another line. There's another line. Here's the a little bit of a curve in here. There's a line. Uh, some wicked things going, going, going there. And and you see that 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 copying won't help you. Instead, if you think, oh, look at this. This finger looks like a block. So in perspective. Is going backwards. So I'm start looking at those things and thinking, oh, look how Jason uh, work the fingers in a way of a block, right? So I can use that in my next drawings. I, I will use that 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 style or that way to show fingers, right? So I'm learning there. So uh, let's go to another example. This is uh, one of my drawings, right? And I see many people in Instagram uh, taking my drawings and draw it uh, and copying them. Uh, and that's okay, that's amazing. You know, that, that to me is, uh, is awesome. I see many artists drawing what I draw and using kind of my style and that, that's great. But the thing is, copying for the sake of copying won't help you, right? Won't, won't get you nowhere. So what you can, you can see and what can you study about this drawing? Uh, for example, figure drawing, because it's a figure, right? You can see how, how Diego simplify this and, and why does he do what he do? Uh, the line quality, right? Why he used those type of lines? Why this line is uh, softer than this one? Why this line uh, is darker than this one, right? And why this wraps around here, for example, L look at these two lines. These two lines are just showing me that this shape is going backwards. It's going in a space, right? And this leg is going the other way. I, I hope you can see that. That's the way to study. And then the style, right? You can see how I simplify things, but that's uh, uh, the way to, to uh, let me put this thing on, right? To copy is studying them, not just copying for, uh, okay, I copy this line, I copy this other line, and then I have the drawing done. And and that won't help you, right? You will get a copy, maybe 
similar, maybe just equally, but you won't understand why. And at the beginning, I don't know if you remember, it was why, why am I copying? What, what do I want to get out of this? this? This minute or this 10 hours I'm sitting trying to copy this artist work. I'm trying to get something out of there. So what is it and why am I doing it? And how do I get something out of it? So understanding there, I'm trying to, to read uh, if there's any questions. Uh, okay. Uh, so yeah, and here we have another one. Th this one we use here, uh, Drawing Force, uh, is Charles Dana Gibson. If, if you don't know, take a look at his work. Uh, it's amazing. And once again, the question is, what do I want to learn here? What can I, wh what can I learn? So let's see, line quality again. We can uh, learn about style. We can learn surface line. Like, take a look. This is not hatching for the sake of hatching, right? This is hatching going over the surface and creating dimension and volume with the use of line. Take a look that this line goes like this and showing me the roundness of the top of the hair. And this goes down and this goes around. I hope you can see that. Look, look the bottom of the nose, right? They're, they're creating that shape. It feels like you can put your hand below her nose, right? And lift it up. Same thing with the neck, right? You also use it for shadow. It's using this line for shadow. And the lovely things is the, the direction of the lines, right? Well, because he can put li straight lines uh, vertical here, but it won't show the volume of the neck going around, right? So it creates another illusion. So all those things you can learn with copying, once again, let me do this, with copying Dana Gibson's drawing, but understanding what you're doing. Because if you just copy the lines, you just copy this line and I don't care, he put it horizontally, well, I do it that, blah, 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 blah. And nothing gets into my brain. And if that's not happening, I'm not learning. I'm just copying like a parrot. And I will sing happy birthday all over again every day without a person who is getting his birthday, right? Uh, do you guys have any questions? Yeah, I just have one comment, which is, um, I'm just gonna take this really deep here for a second. Uh, I really, uh, there's two artists that I typically have students look at and study uh, during mentorship. One is Charles Dana Gibson, which you just saw. And the other one is Frank Frazetta, who I think quite frankly is one of the ultimate masters of using line to sculpt out force. And Gibson is really excellent at sculpting form. Uh, so to really geek out on this, I think when you study an artist, you, in a sense, almost have the opportunity to really get to understand who they are. Um, it's almost like having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. You know, I, I've gone through this stuff myself, which is why I, I teach it to you guys. It's like, wow, I really understand Charles Dana Gibson and who he is. And you can almost get a little bit into the psychology of how he breaks things down, the kind of line he uses, what kind of person he probably was by the way he draws. Like our art is who we are. There's no separation unless you're lying, right? Otherwise it is what it is. It's who you are. And if you get deep enough into really getting into the mindset of the particular artist that you're studying, you really get to understand some flavor of who that person is. You can almost imagine a conversation with them sitting across the table from you uh, as you're going and studying their artwork and feeling the drama, for instance, of a Frank Rosetta pose and just how darn sophisticated it is and his love of his, his craft, you know? So I highly recommend studying from other artists. I think it's a, it's a great exercise and it gives you a chance to have a conversation and get to know that artist more intimately than just kind of looking at their work. You'll learn a lot more by going in and studying than just looking. That I can promise you. Even when you go draw on location, same thing. If you go do reportage drawing and you actually sit and draw, I've been to a lot of places on this world. The ones that I remember very clearly the most is where I sat down and I, I drew, like I studied a place. That Those are the moments I remember the most, you know? Yeah, Jaime was asking like, uh, 
if uh, it would be correct to think that as long as we know what we're consciously looking to learn and why copying can be an effective learning tool. Yeah, exactly. I'm just saying copy, it doesn't work because we need to put a work, a word, sorry, uh, to show you what, just copy for the sake of copying without, without looking for anything, without understanding why or what or how, it's, it has no meaning, so you won't get anything out of it. So yeah. uh, to close this down and, and leave my friends to talk a little bit, copy and study, right? If you want to improve, study. And just a little bit of joke, these are my two cents for today. <laughs> Centava. <laughs> yeah, so, so basically what you guys are saying is that it's important to not just like you know, duplicate the lines of the artist you're studying like a Xerox, Xerox machine, but yes, really try exactly. to understand uh, the why. Why did this artist put this line? If you don't understand the why, you don't have anything. Right. Yeah, I was going to use the same metaphor. You're not a Xerox machine, right? Don't press the, the print button, right? That's what copying is, exactly as Swanley just said. It's There's thought behind art. We're all human beings. There's a lot of stuff that goes on to create a drawing. So don't just copy someone's work, try to get in their mind, right? Through the act of studying. Otherwise copying, you might as well be hitting the print button and that's it, right? All right, let's move on to uh, Mertunje, I believe, right? Yep, let's go. All right. let's see, I control this, I forgot. All right, here we go. Uh, all right, take it away. All right, guys. Um, so, you know, one of the things, you know, this is like a different topic, by the way, this is like more of a like how to. OK, so, yeah, you can see like one of my concepts that I did, you know, it's, it's just for fun, you know. So uh, this is something, you know, it is a very, very important step in the beginning is uh, what what we call this mood board. OK, and it's in the name, by the way. So mood is uh, mood board is like what it create the piece that you're creating so what whatever it is like a character or like an environment whatever and you'll see like an environment slide in a bit by the way so whatever you're creating whatever you want to create okay so the mood board actually depicts that okay you know in a kind of a like a rough space okay so you gather a lot of references basically and you're trying to like come up with many many ideas okay and basically the advantages of creating mood board is, um, you know, first of all, that you take inspiration from a lot of, uh, a lot of places, okay? So, you know, excessive, excessive thinking is, uh, you know, excessive of anything is bad, okay? And by that, I mean, if you have very less references, okay, so for example, going back to the slide of that uh, hammer in the beginning, okay, so you won't eat a soup bowl with a hammer, right? But, if you are just stuck there, so for example, uh, you just have only two things there, okay? You have a soup bowl and you have a hammer and you don't have anything else around, okay? So, and you know, the condition says you have to drink soup bowl, but you cannot lift it up, okay? But you are stuck with only hammer, then what you will do? You just have to get it, uh, get, drink that soup bowl with that hammer, right? Because you don't have enough references. So Moodboard uh, gives you that flexibility of taking references from like many, many sources. So you can brainstorm around, okay? And brainstorm is the correct word, by the way. So yeah, just go around, brainstorm, uh, take references from many things, uh, from many sources, okay? And that will give you like more freedom to take the knowledge and uh, put that knowledge into your final piece, okay? So yeah, this is what you can see. Uh, can you zoom in on that a little bit? Uh, so Is as you can any? see, you know, yep. So as you can see, you know, I just like want to uh, create like a creature bus or something. So I got a picture of a snail, okay? And I got a picture of a shrimp in the beginning where I was not even thinking of, of creating such type of creature or whatever. So I was just brainstorming around and uh, you can see like, uh, I was like, yeah, I can create a creature based on snail and the shrimp. So yeah, I just begin collecting a lot of snail references, seeing the texture, seeing and like how they move and something like that. Okay, so mood board, uh, mood board basically not it's not just about photos. It could be videos. You know, one of the really good references, uh, reference sources that you can get is like video references. Okay, it's uh, far better than images. You know, after all, 
uh, in, at certain places. So for video, video uh, references, what you can uh, call advantages is that you can see things moving, okay? Even if you're like looking at the digital reference, you can see things moving, you can control the speed of the video, you can pause it, you can see like the in-between motions up there while the picture is always static, okay? So yeah, with the video, you can um, yeah, just uh, have more flexibility, okay, looking at the reference. You can uh, change, uh, you can see like things in motion basically. So yeah, this is uh, uh, why I'm giving the re uh, example of video references because I have like video references for this uh, thing as well because I want to see see like how snail moves, okay? So yeah, basically I have some videos as well. You can see like uh, then I have separate board created for the shrimp that, you know, and this is by the cockroach leg, by the way, <laughs> you know? So yeah, uh, basically just a lot of references. And uh, the idea of the mood board is again, uh, as the flexibility and the, you know, it's called mood board. So you have to like create the mood for the thing that you're gonna create, okay? So- hey, if you don't mind, I just wanna, what we didn't frame up here at the beginning is really Mertunje's overall goal here is we're talking about information, right? Like visual mm -hmm. information. So yeah. for me, you learned like, we wanna pick the right kind of image based on what its job is. And that goes for what everyone's teaching today. You heard mm -hmm. from Diego, the difference of copying and studying. And now Mertunje is really trying to share with you guys how do, how do I use information, right? We're information gathering and what's a good way of gathering that information, what's not to end up getting you to your end result, right? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Ritunje, uh, th I think a great addition to this is a question like, isn't that cheating, getting references for a drawing? <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> yeah, yeah, the answer, the simple answer to that is, so for example, you haven't seen a human body and I told you, yeah, just go draw a human body, how you do it, you know? <laughs> so if you haven't seen any human ever before and you don't have a mirror around, so you cannot draw a human, basically. So it's not cheating. That. No? It's not cheating. Okay, it's not <laughs> no cheating. Way. That's amazing. <laughs> so we yeah, are not cheating, know, guys. And, and to go off <laughs> of that, like if you don't know what a shrimp or a snail looks like, um, yeah. It's one thing to sit there and copy a drawing of a snail because you're going to draw some kind of mystical creature in your illustration and you want to throw something that's like a snail in there or even a snail. Sure, you could take the snail image and photo bash it, which is you copying because all you did was take the photo of the snail and throw it in your painting. Or it's understanding what is a snail? What does it feel like? What does it look like? How does it work? And I, I love, Mertunjay, that you brought up the video aspect, right? It's like, I want to understand how it moves. Right, you're educating yourself. You are studying, right? You're, to what Diego said before, you're actually studying based off the references that you chose in order to get to your illustration, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we can bring up the next slide. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, this is the same thing again, like a mood board. And as we discussed before, you know, right type of information, uh, bringing right type of information into our mind and brainstorming around that area, you know, that's like a really good thing. So for example, I need to make this concept because we can see it right there. So I won't bring references for like underwater scenes, okay? Like how things look underwater. I won't bring like references for moss, okay? Like how moss works, uh, like functions or whatever. So yeah, I would bring right type of information, which is, uh, by the way, desert here, okay? So dry places, even like Mars would work for me because in, that's a dry place, you know? I can see like stones in there if I just want to create like a mystical, you know, landscape, like I can go there, but I won't go underwater or I cannot go to like, um, yeah, like heavens, you know, which is like a peaceful place. I just want like, to create a dry place basically. So yeah, this is again, like a mood board thing. Uh, yeah, the, the coming next topic is uh, one of my favorites. So just we can jump to that straight. Is there anything you guys want to add to it? Something? No, add? it's all good. Okay. Yeah. So this is uh, one of the like uh, many, many people ask me this question, um, you know, start, what's like starting from life and what's the difference between like using images there? So these slides, the, the three to four slides, like coming slides, they will literally show you like what, uh, you know, what the advantages of using and what the disadvantage of using deck digital. And I won't specifically target Google. <laughs> you know, you can just like literally grab references from anything. So we can call it like digital references, okay? So you can see, yeah, yeah, it's versatile. So for example, you uh, just want to see 
like Renaissance paintings or whatever, you don't uh, don't have to go to library, you know, in, to see in the books and you don't have to go to actual places to see them, okay? And this gives us versatility and uh, knowledge more about, okay? And uh, yeah, this is also the video you are watching right now on YouTube. This is also a kind of reference, right? So yeah, it gives us versatility, uh, unlimited references. You can have as many references as you want. So, and uh, you can go to different places, you know, it saves your time again, you can uh, read it there and it gives flexibility in your work. So yeah, for example, again, just uh, as the mood boards I created, you know, con to connect to that concept, uh, I can uh, choose like multiple different, like thousands of images and brainstorm around the idea and come up with the best as I can. It's all because uh, possible because of the digital references, right? Uh, for the next slide. And yeah, for the next slide, this is like the negative of using digital references. And uh, yeah, one of the things, you know, I was, uh, I was watching like some interview or something. So that artist is saying about Michelangelo and uh, he was uh, telling basically is one of his story and uh, one of his like, yeah, story. So basically what Michelangelo used to do when he was sitting uh, for drawing, okay. So what he, do, he used to do, he, the model is sitting there and he was just like drawing. So he used to uh, stand up and sit at a certain angle and then draw a little bit. And then he stands up again and sit at a little bit like slight more off angle and draw it again. And uh, one of the, I don't know, this is one of his students or whatever, he just like asked him, why do you do it? And he was like, uh, you know, I, I just want to like feel the three dimensionality of that figure, okay? And uh, this is what like uh, that irony that he's bringing into the figure drawing that he was like, yeah, I don't want to make that figure, like draw that figure from one setting angle, okay? And I just want to use the, you know, that life, uh, what you can say, um, like benefit of it, okay, the benefit of the drawing live, okay, so he was like, yeah, I, if I can go to a slight off angles and draw it like three dimension, three dimensional, why I would just like sit at one angle, I just like draw it from like a starting angle, okay, so that's one of the things, so you don't get like three dimensionality um, in static pictures, okay, and that's one of the things, uh, there's like the light changes and everything, you know, uh, we'll see in next slide, by the way, one of the things that over obsessiveness sometimes take over and what like over obsessiveness is like you become lazy okay so if you uh for example there's like a tree in your like for example like 500 meters from your home and you want to draw it so it's like yeah why why i need to go there you know i can just like type it on google and search it out but you don't know the benefits of you going there and drawing that tree live okay and he was like, yeah, I can just like type it over. I can find it over and I can draw it as many times as I like. And that image won't change. Okay. So that is one thing you can become like over obsessive to the digital images. You get lost with too many references, obviously. So sometimes it happens. It happens with me still. Okay. When I'm like creating mood boards and all, there's like so many images. And, <laughs> you know, when I just like go to different sites, you know, and if I find one, especially it's with Pinterest, because once you click on the image, it gives you all the relatable content there. So uh, yeah, you just get distracted very, very easily. For example, if I find a very cool drawing, I was like, ah, let me, let me see that. Let me see that just for a second. And then, you know, an hour passes just looking at it. So yeah, you just like go, get lost with too many references. You get distracted sometimes. And uh, you cannot manipulate the references, obviously. So for example, there's like a model in front of you and, uh, you can tell them that, yeah, you can like pose something like this or something like that. So you will actually, you can, you can manipulate him. Okay. So you're like, yeah, just uh, move a little bit forward or whatever. Okay. So yeah, you can just manipulate them. Uh, for example, you cannot manipulate a whole kind of landscape if you're painting, for example, but still you can see that wind blowing there. You can see the changes happening there. So it will be like, like a lot more dynamic references that you paint from. Okay. So that's one thing and originality may sometimes lost. So this includes like all the paintings that you see, okay, or all the art that artists create. And again, it brings us to that concept of copying, okay? So yeah, you can see like Dory, see she's always confused. I was like, yeah, I'm getting lost again. 
wait where I'm going. <laughs> so yeah, something like this. So there's something you guys add that. No, I think it's great. I love the Michelangelo piece. Like you said, you know, he was a sculptor, so not only a painter, and he was always thinking in three-dimensional space, and he was an architect, right? Yeah. So um, I think it really was important for him to work from life, you know, to understand three-dimensionality, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and I would say I often hear artists talk, of course, about the uh, art block, you know, not being inspired or not having ideas and I'm like, there is an infinite pool of inspiration to be found in real life. How can you ever run out of ideas? You know, I think it was Ian McKay who said that once that, uh, you know, since he, he used to look a lot of, at other artists, but then someday I think he was uh, trying to draw grass or something like that. And he looked outside and he said, like, he was like, hey, I can just study from reality. And I think he said from that day forward. Uh, mm -hmm. He never got an art block again because there is always so much inspiration and excitement to be found in real life. You know, it's, I would say uh, the true kind of cheating is robbing yourself and others of that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. And we can jump right, like last, uh, yeah. last two slides. Okay. Yeah, we got to watch time. <clears throat> yeah. So just five minutes, from, uh, five more minutes, guys. And uh, this is yeah, one, one of my favorite topics again, you know, real life references. So, you know, why, why do you listen? Uh, you'll always listen to people to, saying that, yeah, you can just go from real life and draw from there. Again, you know, we have discussed all the possibilities there and all the advantages there, but you can still see I have all, also written five more of it because I really love drawing. You know, we all love drawing from life again. So yeah you can touch and get better feel of objects. I, I don't mean don't touch any model, okay? Just don't touch any model <laughs> in a life drawing class. But yeah, you can, for example, there's like a still life there. You can touch it, you can feel the volume of it if, if you're struggling with the shading, of course, right? So you can do that, you know, it forces your thing faster. You know, it's like dynamic. And basically in this point, I'm saying that the reference is dynamic enough so you don't get, for example, you're going to a landscape painting, you don't, don't get all day to capture that particular light there, okay? One of the great example is, uh, for example, if you know Claude Monet is, okay? So what Claude Monet actually used to do, he used to go there on the live location and uh, he just used uh, to paint for 15 minutes there, okay? And then come back home, okay? And for the next day, then again, he just go with everything there. And for the same time period, for the same day and for the same time, he used again, uh, he used to paint for 15 minutes, okay? So, and for the answer that he gives to someone, I don't know, but he says like, yeah, I just want to capture that special light that appears in this 15 minutes of the day. So, you know, you can say like, uh, yeah, how, how much he's concerned about that special particular time. So yeah, the dynamic uh, references, it actually makes you more skillful, you know, because it forces you to work faster right now. And you can see that, like uh, other three, yeah. That picture in the bottom left is the neatest drawing studio I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> I think that tape. that's from an animation. Uh, every <laughs> every it actually creates like a full you, 360. Right. If you run around right. it really fast, right, you would see the <laughs> you'd see the model animation. And it's done. I think it's on Vimeo. I don't remember the name, but I saw that uh, the the video. Oh my God. It's like yeah, that it's animation insane. toy, you know? Where they yeah, it's like, like a, yeah. I forget the name of that machine, but yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's yeah, see. Yeah, so try last that uh, last slide, yeah. And here you can see the dedication of uh, different artists, you know, starting from life. Uh, uh, the first four, four, three images are from Bambi movie and you can see like they're starting from life. The first book is in the animal drawing book, by the way. So yeah, you can recognize yeah. there. Yeah, this uh, is our down. first animal drawing book. Right? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to remember who this was. I think it's Ollie Johnston, believe it or not, when he was much younger, that's sitting here drawing for Bambi <laughs> and this deer is eating his drawings. <laughs> yeah. And the, there's like Glenn Keane in there in the middle. And uh, I don't know who this guy is. I think it's- Yeah, Mike I don't know who this guy is here. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, look at that guy in the dark with that awesome model. <laughs> yeah, it's Mike, by the way. So if you don't know, yes. but uh, yeah, this is this is me at the academy. No, of he's not Mike. He, it's not gray hair there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's about twelve years ago. <laughs> exactly. Another life. 
Yeah. All right, well, thank uh, you. The conclusion. Good. Yeah, just yeah. the conclusion there. So you can see like uh, the one important thing I like I written there is living the moment, okay? So the conclusion is if you go there outside, okay, if you draw live, you just live the moment there, okay? So yeah, if you just want to go uh, have a great experience, just go draw live, you know, that's how I would say. Yeah. Use uh, use digital references because obviously you cannot like uh, go to past, okay, to see things or you cannot go to future, but use it to the point which is, makes it grow. And uh, yeah, you can just like, uh, you can just balance them both. Okay, that's what I wanna say. Yeah, nothing's gonna be drawing from life, folks. I mean, hmm. life is life, but when it comes to information, uh, Google's amazing, right? What you guys have is different than when I had, when I was younger, I had to go to the library, right? And I would spend hours and hours and hours in the library and I would sit and draw in the library. I would study in the library in between classes because there was no Google, right? So that was my, that was my mini Google was the library. Um, so yeah, drawing from life, nothing better. When it comes to just getting information like Matunjay's talking about today, there's nothing faster, obviously, than going to the internet, you know? Yeah. All right. Uh, last but not least, we've got uh, Swenley coming up with our last topic. Yeah, reference for inspiration. Like this is like uh, for me at least when it starts getting like super exciting because you go beyond looking at the reference just for uh, uh, analyzing and studying it. You're looking at it now for. Uh, inspiration, inspiration for ideas, you know, so it's more about uh, reaction, I would say, like, what's, what's the impression, what's the idea that comes up when you look at the reference? Uh, for example, in, in this picture, you can see when I look at this uh, rhythmic uh, gymnast, like she has a very long slender build. So that was the idea that that was my reaction to the drawing. So I went for it, you know, and I, I found that, um, if, if you overthink um, your reaction, you might find yourself um, getting to mediocrity because of fear, because all of a sudden you start second guessing yourself and you start being afraid, is this going to work? What are people going to think? You know, is it going to turn out a good drawing? So I've learned that when I'm doing this to just go for it, you know, which um, brings us to the second point, which is, a risk because um, there is no guarantee that the drawing is going to turn out good you know if you're going for uh, uh, if you're going after an idea and you can do it through exaggeration you can do it uh, through playing with design you know it, it takes it, it's a it's risky because again there is no guarantee that's going to turn out good so um, either that risk is going to stop you or it's going to push you forward. Like if, if you approach the risk from a perspective of fear, it's going to paralyze you. But if you um, approach that risk from uh, curiosity and excitement, uh, all of a sudden it's going to push you forward because now um, you're curious to see, okay, I have this idea, I'm going for it. What's going to, what's going to come out? You know, it, it's exciting. And I know Mike uh, really liked this one, like the taking risk part, right? Yes, I love risk. I mean, where else can you take risk and nothing bad's going to happen? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> right? exactly. Yeah, you know, like, you know, not to get too big into an emotional conversation here, but, uh, you know, we talked about some of this in the past videos over this last month or so about like fear and anger and frustration. We talked about the seven sins and all. But here's your chance, everyone, right? You're, you're drawing, take risk, right? Like conquer your fear, deal with the fear because this is the place where you can push really far. And I think the more risk you take, the faster you learn. You learn by making mistakes, right? Like we've also talked about in the past. So here it is, right? Like to uh, Swenley's point, you know, like get inspired, get really excited, go, ah, man, I'm gonna try to accomplish this idea. I'm gonna push as hard on it as I can. I'm gonna take a risk. If it fails, it fails. It was a drawing, right? So do it again and do it again and do it again until you make it happen, right? Just make it happen. Yeah, dude, like I keep telling students like uh, when they're struggling with fear, I'm like, you don't have to show the drawing to anyone. You know, if, if it turns out totally bad, you can just throw it away or keep yeah. it for yourself. You know, there is no obligation. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. you're not going to die, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, you're tougher than that. Trust us. We're all here and we've done a lot of risk taking and a lot of failing. So you'll survive. All right. Back yeah. Back and show. which yeah brings us to uh, the next part, which is uh, functionality. Like when you push the when you push the, the post, when you really like exaggerate or go after an idea, design idea that you have, uh, like the drawing still needs to work. And um, like Diego mentioned at the beginning about uh, you know the parrot not understanding but just repeating. Like um, here we're talking about like again your reaction or your your idea, your opinion about what you're looking at. Now, um, it's hard to give your opinion about something that you don't understand because, you know, for example, let's take politics. I think it's a very present topic, especially in the U.S. right now. Like, That's if true. I ask you your opinion about politics and you don't understand it, then your opinion is going to be nonsense because it's not based on any true substance, you know. So that's why I would say, like, uh, often students want to get to this part, like, too quick from the beginning. Uh, because it's exciting, you know, you're designing, you're exaggerating, playing with shape and proportions. But first, you need to understand the, the subject matter. And the better you understand it, the more that's going to uh, empower you and enable you to uh, start pushing beyond reality and expressing your own ideas. Yeah, it happens also in caricature. When, when people say, oh, I want to do caricatures and they all they just do is uh, make big noses. And <laughs> yeah, and, and when, when you're doing a caricature, you're not exaggerating noses. It's just you're pushing the like the personality of that person. You can do a caricature being almost a portrait, but just a little move in the in the mouth, like how that person laugh or smile, it makes it. Uh, really, really attractive, uh, the, the, the appealing, the caricature itself. So you yeah. need to know, you need to know wh what you're pushing and to know what to push, you need to know what you're talking about. So that, that example you give about the politics is, is really on point. It's like, yeah, you're talking about something that you don't know anything. It's like, uh, I don't know anything about cars. So if I talk about cars, this car is better than this one. I could only talk about color. I like this car, the color of this car better than the other, but I have no idea. So in order to make an opinion, I need to have the knowledge of what I'm opinioning, opinioning? What, what's that word? Well, uh, about, right? Forming, <laughs> forming an opinion on. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you, you get what, I, what, what my idea, right? It's like yeah. uh, when you're drawing, you need to be, even if you're just copying, uh, you need to know what you're saying. Right, I just I'll, at least a little bit. The caricature thing to me is very personal because um, out of a fear of lack of money, right? So my fear when I was in college was lack of money. I found out that caricatures paid really well. So I was willing to fight my fear in order to try to make the money. And uh, my caricatures, I remember the first event I ever went to was a small boy's birthday party. They were like six or eight year olds or something like that. And I basically just did uh, portraits. I did like portraits of their heads on little bodies, right? But I, I knew I could draw well enough to see. So I trusted that part of me. And I just put little portraits on, you know, on little bodies. Um, but over, I did it for 11 years, by the way, as a side job. I was always like working in some other capacity, but I was making extra money on the side during the weekends. And uh, it took me time, you know, it took me time to like trust the experience to understand better how to have a reaction, right? Like when you get skilled enough, you get in, you know, quote unquote intuitive, which really just means you have a ton of skill in that thing. And, uh, and then I could do a caricature in like 30 seconds or one minute, like really fast. In fact, I, I live in the North Bay over here in California. And I had to, when I was about 25, 26, I had to do a, um, I had to do a golf uh, tournament and I was actually on the, the green for the first hole. And uh, so all the contestants would come up and I literally had about a minute to caricaturize every person. And I was just react, react, react. <laughs> I was just like cranking them out, but that was from all the years prior. I was pro probably about four or five years into caricaturing at that point. And those years helped me develop, you know, a sense of trusting myself, not being afraid and using my skill to illustrate my intuition, right? Like Diego said, it's not just drawing a big nose. It's like, who's this person? It's all the components put together that make that person's specific face. 
And you can get really fast. You know, if you know what to do, it happens very quickly. When you see somebody going really slow, it's typically because they're really care careful. They're unsure, they're belaboring, you know, their thought, they don't really know what's happening and they're being as super careful as they possibly can be, you know. The better, I think folks, artists in general, work pretty quickly because they know what they've got to accomplish, you know, M doing things and making things. I would things like to add something that that, uh, to that, Mike, is yeah, that slow is, not, slow is not wrong, right? It's not bad. Right. But, right. but if you know what you're talking about, you can do it faster, right? And, and, and it's not something that, okay, uh, Mike says uh, you, you need to draw fast. No, he didn't say that. So, so that is what right. I want to clarify, right? It's, it's, it's not, not draw fast just because uh, you want to be better, right? You, no. The speed comes with time. Right, right? exactly. Go yeah. and learn. Once again, if you, if you talk fast, if you don't understand and you talk fast, that's not truth. It's just lying fast, right? Uh, so... Uh, know what you're talking about, speak slow until you know how to speak and then speed up until the moment you, you, you're clear enough, like me speaking in English. Right. Yeah, the speed comes automatically with skill, right? It's not something that you force, not, no, no pun intended, it's not something that you can right. force, but it comes naturally, yeah, like you find yourself being faster because you know what you're doing. Yeah, no, that's exactly, that's, I was just going to say that again, Swanley, exactly. It's like speed comes with time, you know, it's just practice, experience. You know, when you see somebody who's been doing something for 10 years, you can tell that person has expertise. You can see how they, how they move, how they do it. It's very different than if you, you know, if you were cooking for the first time in a kitchen, you're like falling all over yourself. You don't know where anything is. You know, you're spilling salt all over the place, right? And you look at a professional and they know exactly where everything is in their kitchen. They're flipping things up in the air. Right? It's like bartenders. I don't know if you've ever seen bartenders like flipping bottles and stuff. Like they know exactly where everything is. They're flipping bottles back and forth to one another, right? Like they have plenty of experience um, in that act. And the same thing is with drawing. You know, there's no, again, there's no magic behind any of this. It's time and experience. So hopefully in closing here, um, what we tried to help you guys with today is knowing what is the purpose, right? Why are you picking the reference you are picking? What is its job, right? Why am I picking this? I want to do an illustration of a knight on a horse in shining armor, right? Um, I'm going to go find reference of knights and horses and armor, how those things were made. I want to look at horses, what kind of horse, maybe there's a certain region I want this to take place in. By the way, as a side note, which is something we didn't really talk about today, I think one of the most exciting things that we have as artists is these, the subject of reference gives you the opportunity to learn, right? Go and learn about the horses, go learn about the knights and the time period that the knights were in. Is it Knights of Templar? Is it some other kind of knight, right? Learn how armor was put together. It's up to you as the artist as to how far you wanna geek out, right? And how deep down each rabbit hole you wanna go in information. I've met many artists in my career that are probably some of the smartest people I've ever met because within their jobs, they had the time to actually do the research. And they're like, yeah, they know all about how armor is made and all the different types of horses there are and castles. And then they went out and flew over to England and Ireland and actually went to the castles, right? You know, Disney films and DreamWorks, right? These guys fly out the, the leaders, uh, you know, leadership for art teams and they go to these places, right? They go to the locations based on what the film is based on and they go and do research, right? It's fun, right? Keep in mind reference is fun, right? Because it gives you the chance to learn, not copy, learn to study and then take that information and bring that into your work, right? And I think that's sort of the umbrella of everything today is wanting to be aware that research is fun, it's exciting, and you get smarter, right? Like there's nothing bad here um, in any of this. So um, once again, thank you guys for all your uh, time and effort today. Um, hey, uh, and, just yeah. before we close, you know, there's uh, good news for our guys. This is our 31st Force Friday stream. So you can see yeah. how like <laughs> we are long, uh, come a long way. Yeah, and yeah, if you uh, enjoy the stream, you know, please like because uh, 178 people watching and 78 likes. Come on, guys. Diego. Yeah, some of you might be new and don't know this, but we usually try to give you guys a prize if we break 150, and I think we could easily break that today because we had up to yeah, This time it's like Diego something. singing. This time is Diego singing happy birthday on their birthdays. <laughs> exactly. So anyway, to close, like I said, reference is a good thing. 
you know, allow yourself to indulge in reference. It's exciting. It's your own class, right? You're setting up your own curriculum, curriculum on things to learn that you're interested in in your life that are going to help you develop your artwork at the same time. So go and do reference. It's not cheating, all right? It's learning and studying, all right? So as I was saying, thank you guys. Uh, we will see all of you next Friday with another awesome subject. So stay safe um, and take care. We'll see you in a week. Bye-bye. Have a great week. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.